Hey everybody, it's Danny. I want to say thank you for tuning in to the Heartway Podcast. And I want to give a special thanks to those of you who are tuning in from really all over the world. We're so grateful that you are a part of our community and that you listen in on an ongoing basis. If you've been encouraged by what you've heard, I want to ask you to share this with a friend. You never know the impact that one of these messages can have in another person's life. And if you yourself have been impacted and you'd like to continue to partner with us to keep this work going, Check us out at heartwaychurch.com slash give. Every dollar that you give goes a really long way towards helping us do what it is that we do. Well, we love you. Really hope you enjoy the podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Gabby. I'm going to be guiding you in our centering prayer. Welcome. So many beautiful faces. So today I want us to focus on our breathing. And I just had this side note. I, I, I teach yoga. And sometimes I feel like guiding them in meditation is harder than you all. Because you truly understand that we're just connecting with God. So we just have to be still. There's really nothing that you have to do but just allow yourself space so that God can enter and fill you up with love. So what we're gonna do today, I want us all to close our eyes. And I wanna start off by bringing our left hand to our heart. And I want you to take a moment to notice your heart beating. I want you to recognize that this means that you're alive, full with purpose, with so much intention, filled with love. Now I want you to bring your right hand to your stomach. And as I want you to inhale, I want you to fill up the belly. Act like it's a balloon. And then vocally exhale. Again, we inhale, fill up the belly. now at your own pace continue to breathe I want you to notice as you inhale the stomach rises fills up and then the chest opens up and the shoulders go back I want you to allow this breath to go all the way through don't shorten the breath allow it to be natural and realize that as you exhale you begin to release anything that you're holding on to Now find a comfortable position. If you're comfortable with the hands, you stay. If not, feel free to bring them down to the knees. I want us to bring the awareness now back to ourselves, to our breath. I want you to notice as you inhale and as you exhale, I want you to think of a beautiful flower And our center, the center of the flower, is your breath, your point of concentration here, your mindfulness. And the petals around it are just the thoughts. We know they're there, but we don't have to be distracted by them. Every time that your mind begins to wander, you inhale with a little bit more intention, and then allow the exhale to take you deeper. Continuing to inhale, create the space, open up, allow God to fill you up. And then as you exhale, you just release, letting go, knowing that you are enough, knowing that being present in this moment is all that you need. As you inhale, you recognize that you are loving awareness. And as you exhale, you know that that is enough. Continue to breathe. Continue to notice the inhalation as the stomach rises and maybe falls as it exhales. Allowing 
yourself to gently be present here. And when the mind wanders, you gently guide yourself back, mindfully knowing that our attention is within, within the breath, as it flows in and out. Our one true commonality, we all breathe. So as you drift off, know that you aren't alone because we are all one together collectively an energy of love, an expression of God, a representation of his love his miracles in human form. Continue to inhale, fill up that belly. And exhale, allowing yourself to deepen the breath. Allowing yourself to go deeper within, surrendering. We let go now of negative thoughts, thoughts of unworthiness, beliefs that we cannot. And we now know that we are infinite, whole, Worthy, abundant, full of so much love and light. We gently just wake up to this knowing internally, knowing that we are loving awareness, and that is enough. Together, let's deepen the breath. So really inhale, fill up the belly, allow the chest to open, the shoulders go back, hold the breath. Exhale, release. One more time, slowly inhale, fill up that belly. The chest rises, your shoulders are back. Exhale. Now, as if you're breathing through a straw, slowly together, let's inhale, fill up that belly. Inhale a little bit more. Hold the breath. I am loving awareness. Exhale, and that is enough. Gently take a moment to just notice this peace that is around you now that has filled you up, this love that is God's energy and presence. I want you to be aware of this now. I want you to know this is your true state of being. And my friends, you don't need me to guide you into this place because this place is within you at all times. When you feel unaligned, close your eyes. Come back to the breath and allow yourself to be present, one with God at all times. It has been a true honor, my friends. Gently blink open the eyes. May peace, grace, and love always be with you. Amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Good morning, everybody. Y'all can take your seats. How are we feeling this morning, Hartway? Everybody doing good? Man, I love the diversity of this spiritual community. When I look out at every single person who is sitting here, we've got people from different age brackets, different ethnicities, different sexual orientations, different political views, different theological views, and it is 
perfect just the way that it is because this is what the kingdom of heaven is all about and you and I are all a reflection of one another. Every person that you meet, everybody that you see is reflecting another aspect of you. And that is why in the month of February, we are beginning this series called House of Mirrors. House of Mirrors, which is all about relationships. Everybody say relationships. Relationships. Healthy relationships flow from healthy people. And your relationships will only be as healthy as your inner condition is. We always talk about physical health, which is good, right? I was talking to someone before service about the paleo diet and being a vegan and what's best option and working out. And I love all of that. But it's also important for us to talk about things like mental health, spiritual health, emotional health, because all of that stuff, guess what? It's connected and it affects the way that you live your life. So if there's no depth to you as a person, there won't be any depth to your relationships, which is why we are always encouraging people to take that journey inward, the journey of self-discovery, to come to learn who you are, to be in touch with your emotions. You'll never be able to manage a relationship if you can't manage your emotions. So it all starts there. So ask yourself the deep questions of life. Come to know who you are. When you know who you are, you come to know who God is. And when you know who God is, you know who you are. And the further down you go on this journey of self-discovery, what you will come to notice at the end of that journey is that who you are at your core is love. If you're a seeker of truth, if you are a seeker of God, at some point, you will have to surrender to love because love is the basis of all reality. Love is the essence of who God is and love is who you are at the core of your being, whether you recognize that or not. But I'm pretty sure if we were honest, we would all be able to say that it's in those moments that we've been able to taste and experience and get a glimpse of unconditional love, whether it's a love we give to ourselves, a love that's mirrored to us by someone else, a love that we, we, we have received from God, But when we taste that and when we glimpse that, we find a fulfillment that we cannot find anywhere else and in any other way. Look at what the scriptures say in 1 John. Probably my favorite passage of scripture, but I have a lot of them. God is love. When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. And as we live with Christ, Our love grows more perfect and complete. This is good news. This is what Jesus came to spread. This is what Heartway Church is all about. This is how your life can find meaning and happiness. It's gospel. This is the gospel. Life becomes heaven on earth when we take up permanent residence in love. When you come to know who you are as love and you allow that to be Uh, the, The principle that guides every decision that you make and every action that you take and every thought that you think. Our relationships get very complicated when we forget this basic truth of love. Because if you're not in a state of love, you are in a state of fear. And with fear comes anxiety, with fear comes stress, with fear comes a lot of insecurity, and that fear takes that fear takes on a lot of different forms in our relationship. The biggest fear I think most of us have is the fear of being hurt, which then causes us what? To get defensive, to protect ourselves. And when your mind is governed by fear, you end up saying and doing a lot of hurtful things to the people that matter the most to you. And so what would it it look like if love can begin to saturate our relationships? And if we can find this essence of identity, of love within ourselves, and then allow that to determine how we act and interact with other people in our lives. So what I want to share with you today is a little list that I have compiled, and it's very long. Don't make fun of me. It's called Five Loving Decisions That Can Improve Your Relationships. That's going to be my sermon today, (laughs) okay? Five loving decisions that can improve your relationships, and we're just going to dive right in. Here's the first one. This is the decision to be wholeheartedly committed, okay? Relationships don't work if you're only halfway invested in them, right? You have to be fully in. You've got to be committed. If you're in, be in. And the commitment that you're making in a relationship, this is important, 
is a commitment to the other person's good. I am for you and for your good. There's a difference between love, which embodies this full kind of commitment, and infatuation, which does not embody this full type of commitment. Love always wants the other person's good. Infatuation only wants the other person. There's a distinction between wanting another person's good and wanting another person. When you want another person's good, your commitment to them has nothing to do with whether or not those people live up to your expectations. On the other hand, when you're simply infatuated with someone and you don't want another person's good, you just want the other person, your commitment to them is based on whether they live up to their end of the bargain. And that's how most of us do our relationships. Love is about commitment. What I just described in terms of infatuation is a contract. And contracts are just about what you can get out of it. And so already, if you're going into a relationship simply thinking that this is about you and your needs being met and what you can get out of it, it's going to be a very short while before this whole thing crumbles. Actually, a lot of us can hold on to very unhealthy situations much longer than we need to because we're just familiar with people and our heart's not in it. And if that's the case, then what's the point of even doing that? Wholehearted commitment says, I love you even when I don't feel like loving you. Do you feel the difference in that? I love you even when I don't feel like loving you. That's how growth happens. When you're able to work through tension together, because if you're only halfway invested, then the moment your partner disappoints you, Now, automatically, you're going to start detaching. And then what happens? In our worst moments, we start threatening the relationship, and we use that as a fear tactic to try and coerce the other person to line up to our expectations. I'm going to break up with you. Listen, once you've opened that door, it's it's only a matter of time before you walk through it. So don't even open that door. Really, don't even open that door. Be in. And if you're not in, then be out. But once you crack that open and you start using that as a coercion tactic and as a fear tactic again you're 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 flooding your relationship with fear which is only going to bring a lot of conflict and problems when you love somebody you are committed to them not in spite of their flaws but with their flaws with their flaws that's a part of who they are anybody can love people's strengths and love people's gifts and love people's good looks but can you love people's weaknesses Can you love their issues? Can you love their baggage? Can you love where they're coming from? Can you love the effect that all of that stuff has had on these people's lives? Because that's a part of the package too. And if you can't take me in my lowest moments, you can't get me in my good moments either. Because I need somebody who can embrace all of me. All of me. Wholehearted commitment. First things first. You got to be all the way in. Now, I know we're scared of commitment, right? Of course, because what happens if I wholeheartedly commit myself to somebody and then I get hurt? Wholehearted commitment, when you're truly committed to somebody, remember how I define that, being committed to somebody's good. When you are committed to another human being's good, even if it doesn't work out, you're able to part ways without having to strangle each other all the way through it. And can you imagine what it would be like if I can get a divorce and not hate somebody? Some of us don't even think that's a possibility. But I talk to people all the time who have to uh, share their kids with their other half. And they have, what do you call those families? Yeah, joint custody or all these people who have like weird dynamic situations. Not weird. Those are normal. I mean, but, you know, like complicated, complicated situations. And they make it work. They make it work. So when you're committed to another person's good, fine, maybe we're not meant to be together, but that doesn't mean I have to drag you across the floor in the process because I'm committed to your good, which means I'm going to support you in the decisions that you make, and if you're not for me, you're not for me, and that's fine, but I don't have to hate you because of that. We just simply learn how to let go, and I want that other person's good. That's how you find happiness. Wholehearted commitment, wholehearted commitment. It works for you whether you're with somebody who's going to be your lifelong partner or whether it's not going to work out. But we don't have to be afraid of wholehearted commitment because all of us, as people who are made for love and through love and by love, find our fulfillment in being that kind of a person.
Second decision. The decision to be open and vulnerable. Open and vulnerable. Relationships that are healthy always have clear lines of communication. You got to learn how to be honest. You got to learn how to be transparent about the things that are happening within you. Very difficult to do because a lot of us don't even know how to express our emotions because we neglect our emotions. We repress our emotions. We're not in tune with ourselves. So how in the world are we ever going to bring out what's happening within us into a relationship with another person? It's through the practice of vulnerability. Is it a risk? Absolutely. But if you don't take this risk of vulnerability and openness and transparency, what happens is you start to build these frustrations with your partner And because you don't express them, eventually you start stacking up these hurts. You start stacking up all this this, uh, stuff. And you get this long list of reasons why your partner has hurt you and has done something bad. They have no idea because you're holding it all in. And that's when we start overreacting. That's when we start overgeneralizing. And you know, when you overreact to something, You're not reacting to that particular moment. You're reacting to the fact that in your mind, it happened again. I told you. (laughs) You know, the other day I was, uh, Emily had to go get her car to get fixed. And so she was using my car to go to her photo shoots and meetings and do all this stuff. And in the morning, you know, I'm going to the gym and I had like the car for an hour and a half. This was on Saturday. And I always put things where they go in my world, okay? So the keys go on the, next to the door on the little hanger where all the keys are. So I'm ready to go, I'm late to the gym, I'm supposed to meet somebody there, and I go up, I'm leaving the house, and I'm like, where are my keys? Emily's like in a meeting or doing the Peloton upstairs, so I don't even wanna bother her. So I'm like, oh my God, where are the keys? And now in the past, I'm like, are you kidding me? Dude, I always, why are you, I I would've really gone into it. This time, I see the keys on the floor (laughs) next to all her photography stuff, and I just started busting out laughing. I'm like, of course that's where they are. I'm like, this is phenomenal, and I left. (laughs) But now it makes me happy. It makes me happy. Before, you want to know what else Emily does that gets me angry, too? (laughs) This is funny. High five just for fun because I love my wife. Oh, she said, don't worry because I'm I'm teaching next week. (laughs) No, the other thing that Emily does is is phenomenal. I love that she does this now. (laughs) Okay, so in the morning when she's making her toast or her bagels or whatever, you know, she'll get the knife. She'll get the cream cheese or the butter. She'll put it on her bagel or whatever. And then she will leave the knife there on the kitchen counter with all the cream cheese and the butter on. Now, I'm the dishes guy. You know what I'm saying? Or, or like, you know, she'll cook something with eggs, but she's got to go because she's got things to do, you know. So she's making her eggs, and then she leaves the pan just kind of dirty, you know. And I'm the dishes guy. So then I got, and then when it's dirty, it gets all crusty, so I got to go in there, and I got to start rubbing that thing off. And then there's this whole thing that happens. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, if you don't express the frustrations, what has happened in the past is you just blow up. You just, for no reason, it's like, oh, my God, again, you're doing this again. That's what, that's what happens when you overreact. And when you overreact, you start overgeneralizing. You always do this. You never do that. I don't always do this. I don't never not do that. And, and that's true. I mean, in your mind, you're like, you're always doing this. If we're going to be literal, People don't always do that or never do. You know, we we take these extremes. Speak the unspokens. Speak what is unspoken. Tell people what is happening. Tell your partner what is happening within your heart. Because unexpressed emotions don't go away. They just resurface in ugly ways. It's always like that. Now, this is what makes relationships beautiful, right? I mean, we get provoked, We get challenged, we get triggered, we get angry with one another, but it's through all of the mood swings and the arguments and the conflict and the the angry nights that we come to discover who we are. If we take those moments as opportunities to look within ourselves. So be open, be vulnerable. Third decision that can improve your relationships. All of this flowing from love. The decision to always see 
good intentions. This one, my favorite one. And this one radically has changed my relationship with my wife. Like nothing else. Regardless of what this woman does, I will always assume good intentions. Always. And by doing that, because here's the thing, like, (laughs) my wife sometimes, you know, (laughs) she can, it it just comes off strong. (laughs) All right, it comes off strong. Whatever whatever it is, yeah, yeah, hey, that's good, that's good. It comes off strong. But, you know, in the past, whenever she would say something to me and it would come off strong, I would take it really personal. And I would think that she's angry at me or she's mad at me or she's, like, judging me. But the reality is... The way she's talking to me is how she talks to herself. That's how she motivates herself. That's, how, that's her inner talk. So, of course, if she loves me, she's going to talk to me in that same way. So now when I assume good intention, I don't have to take things personally anymore. So I can look beyond the surface of the expression and see the heart of what's really being communicated. So you have to establish with your partner that you are for each other and not against one another. Last year, <laughs> last year, Emily and I, um, I even, I forget what triggered the conflict, but we, we, it was, it was a, that, that particular moment of conflict and how we were able to handle that began to shift things for us. And I'll never forget, <laughs> we were sitting at the table in my townhouse and I was frustrated as I expressed this, but this is what came out, and it's what needed to come out, and, and, and we just understood each other. We were on the same page. I said, you don't get it. I said, look, everything that I think is wrong with you is what's wrong with me, and everything you think is wrong with me is what's wrong with you, and then I said, talk about a, a mind explosion, right, but that's actually the truth because your partner is a reflection of you. Anyhow, then I said, babe, I want you to know that I'm for you. I'm not against you. I'm on your team. Sometimes it feels like we're like, it's like this. I'm for you. I'm not against. And we got to establish our intentions towards one another and just get all the other stuff out of the way. Because what happens is you genuinely want to help. I genuinely want to help. I, you see things that can be corrected, that can fix the situation. I see things that can be corrected, that can help the situation. We, we have a kernel of truth, but sometimes the way that we express it, if it's coming from a place of pain, isn't necessarily the most effective way to express things. So when I know that you're for me and when I assume always good and positive intention, now I don't have to guess. Now I don't have to guess anymore. And that allows me to make space for my partner to express what they need to express, to say what they need to say in the way that they need to say it and express it without invalidating their feelings in the process. Your partner is never wrong for feeling the way that they feel. Do not argue with the way that a person feels because that is how they feel and it's valid and it's okay. You may not understand it, but you can always seek to respect it and you, you make space for people to be able to be fully themselves. This is what's on my heart. This is what I'm struggling with. Can you handle this? <laughs> right? Can you handle it? Some of it, it seems like it's too much to handle and we try to say, whoa, hey, don't come at me like that. But it's mostly an ego thing. It's mostly an ego thing. You feel like your ego is being shot down and so you have to defend yourself and protect yourself. Hey, don't talk to me like that and don't talk to me like this. And ego, 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 (laughs) ego. Really, that's all it is. Meanwhile, our hearts are just trying to express themselves but nobody's understanding. And then we feel like nobody understands us. And then we're in a relationship and we feel alone open, be honest, be vulnerable, be transparent, and give room for your partner by assuming good intention to be able to say what they need to say without invalidating their feelings in the process. Here's the fourth decision that can improve your relationship. The decision to celebrate your partner. Emily and I uh, were contacted by a few friends who are videographers, and they create like these awesome videos and they've been doing documentaries on people who are influencers in the South Florida area 
And my wife and I got on that list. And they're like, hey, we want to do a little mini documentary about Heartway and the journey you've been on and Emily's photography business. And so it was a wonderful opportunity. They, they followed us around for a day. They came to our house, started asking us questions. And there was a part where Emily was just kind of on her own. And they were asking her about just how she feels about our last five years of life and everything that's happened and how beautiful this community is. And then they started talking about me and, and they started asking Emily questions about me and how, how she feels about me. And in the midst of all the things Emily was saying, she, she, there's one little short phrase. Mind you, I, I'm a words guy. All right? Words of affirmation are big for me. It's just how I grew up, I guess. I don't know. Hearing words from my parents has always meant a lot. And so I'm a words guy. Emily, all she says, she's like, I'm, I'm just so proud of him. And as soon as she said that, oh, God, she's proud of me. The people recording the video were like, dude, we have to stop because you're crying so loud. Like, are you all right, bro? Like, she, she just said she was proud of you. I'm like, I, I know, but, you know, you can never really hear that enough. You know, and it's the words Words that are coming from people that we love and that we're close to, whether they're negative or positive, those are the words that we really take the most personal. Those are the words that we tend to internalize in human, as, as human beings. Those words matter. Those words matter. And guess what? We don't celebrate each other enough. We don't celebrate each other enough. We're always pointing out what's wrong, what needs to be fixed, what needs to get better. And we, we miss out on this wonderful, complex, and complicated gift that's right in front of us that God has placed in our life for this season. Even if, again, even if it doesn't end up working out long term with the person that you're with, if you're with them right now, this is God's gift to you now. And then it'll be God's gift to someone else later. But that's why I can say, you know what, I'm just going to give my all to this thing right now. I... I'll, I'll save that one for a podcast. I was going to say a comment, but essentially, even like this, I, I'll just be honest about it. Even if my wife were to cheat on me, I would still assume good intention. It's not about me. And that's a decision that she made for herself in a particular moment. And I am committed to her good. So we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but... Otherwise, what? For me personally, fear. You know, fear all the time. So you say, oh, Emily travels a lot. You know, she's out of town a lot. What is she doing in those weddings? You know? And then, and then it doesn't help. She comes back. She's like, oh, my God, you know, this guy was hitting on me at the wedding. And like, oh, my God. And, yeah, and then they said I was beautiful. And I'm like, oh, great, you know? <laughs> so at some point, it's just going to be like, look, you, you release. You know what I mean? So most people become unhappy because they filter their present relationship with someone through the prism of the past. That, that's what, ooh, I like that collective. Mm. We can start doing this too, the little snapping, right? One of, our, one of our pulse groups has been doing that when somebody says something. So when we filter this person who is in front of us through the prism of the past, we're, we're not even dealing with this person anymore. We're dealing with an image in our head that doesn't really, even really exist. We don't give the people the opportunity to be who they are now. How do you know who this person is now? You never have your partner figured out. You are, you are interacting with a mystery, a divine mystery. And it's endless. That's the beauty of a relationship. You endlessly get to know somebody that you'll never totally figure out the moment you think you figured them out. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> it's not good. It isn't. So what is the story that you're telling yourself? Because we build these frustrations and we have legitimate frustrations and disappointments which we then interpret, right? We interpret those events. We interpret those moments through our pain and through our hurt, which then causes us what? To frame our relationship within a narrative that is very disempowering. What is the story that you are telling yourself about your partner, about your relationship? Because if you can change that story, you can change the relationship. If you can change the story, you can change your relationship. Some of us, if we're single, our story is I'm never going to find somebody that's right for me. Or if we're in a relationship, I can't trust my partner. Or my partner's going to hurt me. 
they don't ever understand me. There's no hope for this person. Or whatever, they're, they're very hard-headed and stubborn and they never listen to anything that I say. If that's your story, that will be your reality. And you will find more and more reasons to justify why that story is true. Because where your focus goes is where your energy flows. So what, is, what are you focusing on in the relationship? We focus so much on everything that's wrong, how our partner isn't meeting our needs, how they hurt us again last time. We keep focusing on all the negative and we miss out on the little improvements. We miss out on the small ways that people actually have changed and have actually improved and have actually made some adjustments, but you're completely blinded to it because you haven't changed, because you're still the same. You see how that works? So it's going to take, it, it, it's an F word. It's going to take the F word for you to be able to do this well. Forgiveness. <laughs> right? Some, some of y'all actually thought I was going to say, just say, <laughs> F it. And at hard way, anything can happen. So no, 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 but not today. All right? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. My favorite definition of forgiveness rocked my world when I heard it. I wish I would have came up with it myself. Forgiveness is realizing that what you thought happened didn't happen. Forgiveness is coming to the recognition that what you thought happened did not happen. And so now you reframe the narrative. You retell the story from a higher perspective, from a, from a higher level of consciousness and awareness. Don't be with somebody if you're going to continually bring up the past over and over and over again. People are not the mistakes that they make. And don't ever confuse who your partner is with what they have done. Don't ever confuse who somebody is with what they have done. Look at who this person is at their core. Celebrate that. Affirm that. And start weighing your words. Scriptures say the power in life and death is in the tongue. Right? What, are, what kind of power are we, are we bringing and energy are we bringing into our relationship through the words that we speak? This is huge. And then the last decision is the decision to give freedom. Very difficult for some of us. Because for some reason in our mind, uh, love and desire, and it's just uh, the human predicament. Love and desire ends up turning into possession and control. My wife my husband, my partner, my, 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 me, 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 and they do everything I say and everything I want, and if they don't, I'm going to let them have it. That's how, that's, come on, that's how we do it. Love is not possession. Love is freedom. Love is freedom. And the freedom that you're offering to your partner is the freedom to be who they are without the need for you to fix them or change them. If you can only love your partner as they are when they change, then you don't really love who they are. You love those aspects of them that resemble you. That's called narcissism. And when we're always taking that position of parenting or controlling or fixing, what we are communicating, whether it's intentional or not, to our partner is that they are not enough. They are not enough. There would be times where Emily would say, that I'm just not good enough for you. And at first I would reject that. And then later I came to realize, yeah, because in my mind I have some idea of a, you know, I don't know what. I have in my mind an idea of something that doesn't exist. And now, I, now, now, talk about flipping the story. Now she's too good for me. I'm like, what did I do to deserve this? I'm like, oh my God. But really, that's the story. It's the, st the story has to change. And my story for a while was not a good one. It was not a good one. The story has to change. And you give people freedom. Give people the freedom to be who they are. Because if your partner always feels like they're not enough, like there's no everything they try and do is just never enough for you, of course they're never going to listen to your feedback. Of course, when you have something valid to say about a tweak that we can make to help the relationship, of course they're not going to listen to you because they don't feel secure and there's no trust. And so how are they going to respond to your criticism and feedback? Of course, by protecting themselves, defending themselves. If they feel like they're being attacked, they're, they're going to attack back. 
So set your partner free. Set your partner free from your judgments. Set your partner free from your bitterness. Set your partner free from your unforgiveness. And in the process, as you set them free from those things, you're also setting yourself free too because that lens is not a fun one to look through in relationships. And what will happen is if you don't figure this stuff out, it will follow you to all of your relationships because it's not the other person, it's you. Mind you, sometimes, again, yes, it doesn't work out with somebody. And that's okay. But since I'm wrapping up the sermon, look, if you've done all these decisions, hold on, go back. If you've done all these decisions and it still doesn't work out, I don't know what to tell you. Go to therapy. (laughs) I don't know. I can't help you anymore, okay? But just give freedom to your partner and set your, allow your partner to be who they are in this moment and let that be enough for you. Last passage of scripture for us to leave with. With tender humility and quiet patience, always demonstrate gentleness and generous love toward one another, especially towards those who may try your patience. Be faithful to guard the sweet harmony of the Holy Spirit among you in the bonds of peace. Being one body and one spirit, as you were all called into the same glorious hope of divine destiny. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the gift that relationships are. Every relationship we have is a mirror of ourselves. Today, God, we make a commitment first and foremost, to you and to ourselves. We make a commitment to embody love in our relationships. And as this commitment flows towards other people, as we start becoming more open and vulnerable and honest about our emotions, as we start to assume good intentions from those that we interact with, as we celebrate our partner and, and, and speak words of life and affirmation, and as we give ourselves all the gift of freedom, we know that through your spirit, you will create something very beautiful in our lives that will change us for the good. So help us, God, to see all of our relationships in this way, in this light, through this lens, so that we can experience the fullness of love that you designed for us in life. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. Love you tremendously. Don't forget on your way out to sign up for the... uh, outreach, and then come on Wednesday to Pulse Groups. Love you guys. See ya.